Hey there, spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scarish Podcast. Woo. I'm Rob Gears, this is Adam Diaz, Hello. and tonight Adam has a really long topic. <laughs> I like how that's what you lead with. I just think it's crazy that, that yours is just going to be so intense. It's, it's definitely going to be intense. It's not going to be super, super long. I've definitely had longer scripts. Really? Yeah, I mean, I did like the Manson Family trilogy. Yeah, but you broke that up into three episodes. Each one of those scripts was longer than this script, though. This is my longest script, I would say, in like two months or so. All right. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm going to be covering uh, the Bhopal chemical disaster. Robin, what are you going to be covering this week? I'm going to be covering the Joshua Ward house. It's Interesting. just a, another haunted house. Okay, cool. I've never heard of that. So, in fact, I had never heard of mine until tonight. I've never heard of either of these. Cool. This will be really, really exciting then. Uh, so before we get started, I want to bring up one thing. Uh, so when we do live shows, we accept donations from people who come and watch us live. It's really nice. Uh, we'll give shout outs to them if they uh, donate to us and we'll typically have up a goal for the month. And for the month of July, our goal was if we reach $200 in donations for the entire month, we would have an additional stream where we are going to have a bartending competition between Robin and I. We're not bartenders. We're not bartenders. We're just enthusiasts. I haven't been. I'm not been... even an enthusiast. I'm not even. Robin thinks she's a great bartender. No. She's I... talked all this shit to me live on the air. You can check out those no, episodes on YouTube. No, it's not about me being a bartender. I just make my own drinks that I drink myself that are good. Robin's like, I'm going to mix two hard liquors, but they're both flavored, so they'll taste good, right? Yeah, and you put juice in there, And too. then she just convinces herself they taste good, and then she's all wasted. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be a fun time. We're going to be doing it this Sunday, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is the 15th. Um, we're going to announce an official time once we know when everyone can get together. Cause we're going to have to have judges cause it's a competition and everything. Uh, but shout out to everyone who watched us and donated during the month of July. You folks are all amazing. And please join us at youtube.com slash scarish or twitch.tv slash scarish podcast, uh, on Sunday to observe the bartending competition. We hope it'll be a fun time. Uh, aside from that, uh, we just want to go ahead and give some Patreon a shout outs. I will let Robin take that. All right. So I want to give up some shout outs to some amazing patrons, Jessica, Sam and Andrew and Ethan. Thank you guys so much for being such big supporters of our show. Everybody on Patreon who supports the show, you guys are absolutely amazing and let us do what we do and make content for you. It Indeed. rhymed. <laughs> Well done. Thanks. Also, safe travels to Sam and Andrew who are traveling to Isle of Man. Are they doing that this month? Yeah, I think they're leaving, if I'm not mistaken, like within the next day or so. What? So, wow. uh, hopefully you all have a nice trip and I can't wait to see your photos on all the social medias. So, all, all I right. can hear is like Sam from uh, Samwise Gamgee from Lord of the Rings. She watched Lord of the Rings <laughs> while she wrote her script. But it's just how he says potatoes. Potatoes. I don't know why that's all you can hear right now, but uh anyway okay uh why don't you get oh no i'll go first i'll get into my topic that'll be what i do first okay so this week i'm gonna be sticking to american soil i know a lot of our topics are like all over the world different countries um this one's probably pretty well known for anybody who's into paranormal stuff i'm into paranormal stuff, stuff. i've never heard of um, this, so. this location is like the stage of a good old american like horror story right um, a lot of places we cover are locations that have witnessed terrible tragedies. And one of the more well-known locations in the United States is Salem, Massachusetts. Gotcha. Uh, and the occurrence of the Salem witch trials, which was absolutely terrible. A structure that seems to blend in with a lot of the architecture there in Salem is that of the Joshua A. Ward house. And I'd never heard of this house before, you know what I mean? Uh, but this three-story brick building was originally built for a retired sea captain named Joshua Ward. And it was built in the 1780s. So the building that stands there now was built in the 1780s. One of Ward's esteemed guests at this particular building was actually George Washington. So wow. George Washington was one of his guests, stayed at his house when he was visiting Salem in October of 1789. Uh, so he was already, I think George Washington was like 50 something, 52, something like that. Um, it's located in modern day downtown Salem district. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty hip 
hip place to be, I guess. Sounds kind um, of terrifying. If George Washington was there at some point, it's definitely very old. Yes. I imagine it's filled with ghosts. So that house doesn't necessarily have a lot of history, scary history to it, but the land that that house is built on has its own history. So what used to be on that plot in that same spot was much worse. So Did you have to read The Crucible in high school? Oh, no. The Crucible is set on the backdrop of the Salem Witch Trials. Really? And it's just about how people decided to take this panic and accuse other folks of, you know, being a witch and how other folks played into the panic to get other people in trouble. And it's just this... I don't, it's probably because it was my junior year and there's nothing else I wanted to do for first period than read. Uh, but I found it quite Wait, boring. Wait, you could do whatever you want? No. In first it was period? English. It was English. Oh, oh, oh. I wanted to do anything else but read oh, this gotcha. story. Oh, Okay. And uh, because, you know, your teacher's telling you, like, this is what you have to do. Uh, I don't know. I just didn't enjoy it as much as I think. Like, if someone were to walk up to me like, hey, I have a short story for you to read. Uh, it's set during the Salem Witch Trials. I was like, fuck yes, this sounds awesome. And I'm thinking about it now, like, that is that is what The Crucible was, and I fucking hated it. So I was wondering if you read it and what your no, impressions were. No, no, no. I, I, I feel like any of my English or my lit classes, we didn't have to read. I, I think we read Beowulf. That was one that we had to read. We read that as well. Um, But when I was going to school in Texas, they made us do book reports, but we got to choose. So they gave us a bunch of things to choose from, and then you wrote a, a report on whatever, you know, uh, when I was going to school in Hawaii, our book reports, you could choose a book. So, so I chose like two R.A. Salvatore books, <laughs> but after, Nade. after the second one, my teacher's like, you can't do another one of these after this. That's it. Read something else. I was just like, but they're so good. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's not what's important. I don't even know how we got on this tangent. Just me asking you um, about the crucible. Okay, I think okay. that's good, important information to know about Robin. Cool. All right. You good haven't stuff. read it. Haven't read it yet. Um, so the land that this current building is built on is where George Corwin had had his home slash jail located during the 1680s. So who is George Corwin? You may be asking yourself. I know Adam's like, I don't know who the fuck that is. I'm like, asking that right now. Um, he was the 25 year old sheriff who was responsible for interrogating those suspected of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials. So during like 19 or 1692 and 1693, he was the one who was just like interrogating everyone, torturing everyone, making them confess, do all that stuff. Did he have the handbook, the witch's handbook? Um, yeah. Uh, the, you getting into that? The Malleus Maleficarum or whatever Malus it's called? Malleus Maleficarum, yeah. So this guy was actually nicknamed the Strangler, probably because of all the people that he had hanged, you know. Um, he carried out some awful death sentences for those that were found, quote unquote, guilty, you know. The entire idea behind a witch trial where it's like, so we're going to murder you. And if you survive, you're a witch. The, well, like the... And if you die, you're not. But there's also no consequences for anyone being wrong right. ever well, the... is the stupidest fucking thing, I swear to God. And the logic where it's like, okay, if you die... You're not a witch, but you just know that you're going to go to heaven or whatever shit. Because like, you are innocent. Yeah, it's so fucking stupid. People are awful. Anyway, so under Corwin's hand, this sheriff, there were 19 men and women that were executed. They were either hanged or succumbed under the different interrogation tactics. So like drowning, like you were talking about. Um, we'll probably cover the horrors of the actual witch trials in a future episode because that is a lot to, to to go over you know what i mean a lot it's happened. pretty horrific it is her absolutely horrific i also referenced it in the haunted asylums episode because i covered an asylum that was built in the same area where the salem witch trials really? took place yeah nice i went and listened to that because i was looking for a different asylum that we were recommended that i'll talk about in my script okay cool 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 all right yeah so that that book that you were talking about what well, would have to be covered in that episode it's just there's so much when it comes to the salem witch trials that that can't be covered in in like just a topic like this it's just about a haunted house you know what i mean um but yeah all that stuff happened it was real it was it's crazy it's awful uh but yeah so about this this house this place 
So Corwin in particular was something like a sadist. He was absolutely awful. Uh, he performed some pretty brutal interrogations, like Adam was saying, like we we're talking about, like he, he died getting interrogated or you survived and we're like a witch, you know, it's just nuts. Um, but he was unnecessarily aggressive and violent. And he even did things like people would get crushed by rocks. They would keep piling rocks on people and did it until they died, trying to get people to confess that they were witches. You can imagine he experienced his fair share of being cursed by victims, right? With their last breath, you know? Um, I would definitely curse him to the end of the years. Ends? End? The earth has no end. It's a round. <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, I would just, I, if, if I were in that situation, I would definitely curse him. Like, he, he gonna go to hell. I wouldn't just be like, curse you, curse your family. Like, fuck you. Fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> um, you do that line read much better than I do. <laughs> that is the uh, Kevin Bacon from Tremors, fuck you, that Robin uh, just quoted in just case you were wondering. I love that movie. It's so good. Okay. One of the famous executions that he performed, I guess you would say, was that of Sarah Good. So he refused to, or she refused to admit that she was a witch. She was like, I'm not a witch. And her last words were, quote, you're a liar or you are a liar. I'm sure she wasn't like, you're a liar. No, uh, she said, you are a liar. I am no more witch than you are a wizard. And if you take away my life, God will give you blood to drink. Um, and once she said that, Corwin just proceeded to hang her and four other witches that day. I think all at once, too. Um, a reverend named Nicholas Noyes was there and he, he was demanding that Sarah Good confess her sins. Damn it. I was really hoping this reverend was a good guy because no. I could be like, he gets shown me like, I'm going to bring the noise. People like to say it's coincidental, but he died bleeding from the mouth. Apparently, Super coincidental. Yeah. Apparently one of his blood vessels has, had popped and that's what killed him. And so they say that he died because she cursed him in like her last moment so it's like witchcraft but i don't think so i think it's just coincidental if you could do that with your witchy powers you would do that before you were at the end of a hangman's noose yeah that way you wouldn't get hung right uh corwin died of a heart attack or a su suspected blood clot it, uh, different sources have different things right but he did die within his home and he died on april 12th 1696 at the age of 30. So he died really, really young. And I don't know if that's because, you know, he did some shitty things and it's just all of that caught up with him. Maybe the stress of having to do all that stuff. I don't know. Poor dude. But, <laughs> but the stress of having to murder innocent <laughs> right. women. Uh, but people hated him. So maybe everybody was just like beaten down on him for being such a shitty person for so long that he just kicked the bucket. Um, but he was entombed in the cellar of his home. Um, and people assume it's because the ground was probably too frozen to dig and actually bury him in a cemetery right away. Um, but he was despised so much to the point where his family feared for the fate of his body. So they didn't want him to get dismembered by the public, you know, so they just kept him in the cellar for years until he was moved to Broad Street Cemetery, which is where he's buried now. Um, if you haven't listened to our house buying superstition episode yet, there is one particular superstition about not building a house on top of the spot where a house once stood. I remember that. Yes. So the Joshua Ward house is certainly no exception because it seems like it was built on top of where that house once was. So seems like the ghosts that haunted the uh, Corwin's home at one point were more than happy to move in to the new building. <laughs> like, oh, I like this place. It's yeah. nice. So, uh, understandably, there are a number of entities that are said to haunt the current structure, the current house. Uh, seances have been held over the years, and they've kind of come up with three distinct spirits that exist within the building. So, there is one that is the suspected spirit of one of the unjustly executed victims. And this spirit seems to be of a woman with unruly black hair 
that is seen roaming the halls of the buildings, usually on the third floor, so the top floor. Uh, Supposedly, during a Christmas party sometime after a realty company took over in the 1980s or something like that, um, they were taking a bunch of Polaroids because Polaroids used to be popular. I think they're a little popular again now. One of the but... funnest things about parties back in the day was like you get that disposable camera that you wind up like, jeet, 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 click, and you didn't know if what pictures picture were going to be on it enough. yeah, until you developed it. And if you found one on the table or at a party and it still had pictures, like you just took a selfie. Like, I don't know whose camera this is, but they're getting my face. And, do they uh, still sell those? I'm sure they do. They got to be like in the retro section nowadays. Oh, okay. Since everyone has cell phones that have cameras. But I do remember that being like one of the more popular things at all the family events I'd go to. And my uncle would be like, let's go look around for cameras and put our faces on them. And uh, we take like selfies of us making ridiculous faces when I was a kid. So, That's cute. Yeah. Fun, fun memory in the midst of a horrific topic. Yes. Thanks. Um, so among these photos, among these Polaroids that they were taking, there was one that had the image of what seemed like an angry female entity. So it had the unruly hair, you know, it was like crazy hair and the entity was all dressed in black, like a black dress or something like that. And it was caught in this photo and it really looked translucent and really weird. Like it didn't belong there. And it was just in this empty hallway in one of these pictures that was taken, uh, which I think is really creepy. Um, another entity may be that of a man named Giles Corey. So this uh, person was a farmer that was falsely accused of witchcraft. And apparently they were really stoic about it. And they, they were like, obviously they're not a witch or anything like that. But, um, because he was just like not fighting, you know, he wasn't like a dick about it, like arguing with, uh, what's his name? Corwin. I think that pissed him off, pissed the sheriff off that he was just like so calm about it and just like, I'm not a witch. You, you guys are stupid, whatever. Um, he was one of those victims that were killed by being crushed by rocks during an investigation. So there was no way you could behave during these interrogations that was acceptable. No. Th- you you no were way. either calm and guilty or you were frantic and fearful and yeah. guilty. He had been personally tortured by Corwin. Uh, apparently one of the famous acts of his was asking for more weight as he was being crushed to death. So as so this guy that's being killed is like, more, please. Yeah, he's just like, because cause they're trying to, to get him to confess to being a witch or, or, or performing witchcraft or whatever. And he's, I, he's obviously like, I'm not going to confess to doing this. Just put more weights on me, you know? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was one of those that cursed Corwin with his dying breaths as well supposedly of course there is no actual evidence that he actually did that you know but i like the idea of that legend that says that he actually did um because corwin deserved it that being said seems like he wasn't going to take things lying down as he seems <laughs> to <laughs> that's fucked up <laughs> i didn't actually mean I for that, that to be a joke. joke it was not a joke okay Oh, but he seems to haunt the building even now. So he seems to be the mischievous ghost out of all the spirits. Um, moving things, messing up rooms, like to- literally tossing rooms, uh, flipping trash cans over, like trash out of the trash cans. Candles are found in like wax puddles, like candles get melted. Um, other candles get melted into S shapes. Like, say you have one of those long candles, they get turned into S shapes. That's weird. We, and th- that's what I was just like, that's very deliberate. That's a very deliberate shape. I don't know what could have happened. It stands for hope on his planet. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> that's the Superman reference. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, if I were Corey, right, it's all around justified dick moves. I mean... I would totally do that stuff if I wanted to haunt people. I mean, if you died in a horrific way being accused of something you didn't do. The least of your worries is a melted candle. I was going to say, you're really not inflicting revenge Um, on anyone by being like, I'm going to make this candle curvy. But, uh, of course, there are the typical cold spots in different rooms and things like that. The uh, big spirit that usually gets talked about most is that of George Corwin himself. 
apparently back in the mid-1980s, which, dear God, sounds like it's a really long time ago, but it wasn't. It was not that long ago. I mean, I'm thinking about it now. It's 2021, 1980s. I was born Look. in 85. Like, mid-1980 was my birth. I'm not that old, so I don't want to believe that mid-1980s is old. Okay. It's not old. Um, It was reported that people would feel like they were being choked by some unseen entity on the second floor. Um. And maybe it's it's Corwin just like choking people out, like thinking everyone's witches, you know. But he's not gonna like the way these witchy ladies act nowadays. <laughs> he'll start choking them, and they'll be like, "Harder, harder, daddy!" No, um, he seems to be found sitting in a rocking chair by a fireplace sometimes too. Uh, many believe that while he was alive, Corwin quote unquote un- interrogated slash uh, strangled people within his home but there really isn't any evidence that he actually did that but i can i can see his spirit kind of walking around being like i hate you hate you hate you you know what i mean uh so people are pretty wary going to the second floor of the house uh in the 1800s the building transitioned from a house to a hotel the washington hotel aptly named probably uh coming off of that visit from george washington right i think um Somewhere I was reading, they actually put like a statue in one of the rooms, like a, a stone statue of George Washington standing at one of the windows, which is all right. Interesting. Um, I mean, I would milk that for all it's worth. <laughs> the father of the nation visited my establishment. <laughs> We're fucking renaming it. Get the guy who carved shit out of stone. Uh, the 1900s saw the construction of a large multi-storied commercial building on the front lawn of this house. There had originally been plans to demolish the house and build uh, a commercial building on top of it, on top of that property. Um, But luckily for the structure, there were efforts made to protect this house as a piece of history. So what they did was they tore down the commercial building that got built on the front lawn, refinished the front lawn, like redid it to make it look nice, right? Get rid of all that commercial crap. And uh, now it's really nice. Like the front yard and everything. The house looks really nice. At one point, it was set up to offer business offices. It's been home to companies like the Higginson Book Company. Oh, yes. And uh, different re- real estate companies. The Actually, the very real estate company that took those pictures and, and captured like the spirit of the, the woman in black type mm. thing. Um, in 2015... It got turned into a luxury boutique hotel called The Merchant. That will run you about $100 a night. That's not bad. Um, I already checked. Halloween is booked out for the year. so Bummer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, went on some websites to check if it was that hotel right now. And so um, I was just checking and seeing like, oh, well, it's making me put in a date. I'll just put like right past Halloween like... Before and then after Halloween, and it was like, nope, there's no dates. But if you want to come in November, there's dates in November. I was like, ugh, that's silly. That's silly. <laughs> but uh, if you're not interested in staying the night, you can book tours there if you prefer. Of course they do. Uh, the modernization of the area doesn't seem to keep the hauntings out, though, because weird stuff still happens there. Probably not as frequently reported, you know. Um, but the current structure is listed on the National Register of Historic Places as of 1978. Uh, there are thousands that visit this landmark every year, though there are lots of locals that say at night they definitely take other streets. <laughs> they don't take the main street that that house is on. And they try to avoid passing that house whenever possible. That is interesting. Yeah. So some people like spooky stuff and some people just want to avoid it. I mean, if you're a local, spooky stuff probably doesn't seem as interesting to you if you constantly have to deal with it. Yeah. You're like, um, no, nah, I'm going to go the other way that I don't feel super creeped out about. Yeah. Because it's not like you're just visiting. You're just like touring the super terrifying spot and then leaving. Like, right. You have to deal with it all the time. Mm-hmm. So I kind of understand that a little bit. I still want to check it out, though. So yeah. bummer that it's booked for Halloween. <laughs> Why would you want to go on Halloween? We got a convention <laughs> that Do week. Do we? Yeah. Oh. We have a convention the week after that. Oh, well, or that's the weekend the, after that. That's the weekend after that. But yeah, still. but then you have to fly from Seattle and then to, or to 
Portland and then to Massachusetts. Yeah, it's too much flying. <laughs> There's a Salem in Oregon too. So yeah, oh, that's there it funny. is. Interesting stuff. Good topic, Robin. I will say apologies to anyone who likes short episodes because you ain't going to get one this time. All right. Because uh, mine is long, like I mentioned. But I think most people will en- enjoy a long topic. So. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and mine is complete. It's not like it's long just to be long. I wasn't putting in a bunch of bullshit stretcher words like you do when you're writing an essay that has to be five pages. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm at three and a half. I need to fluff this thing up. It's contextual. So all right, before nice. I get into it, though, let's go ahead and take a quick commercial break. I was going to say that. Nice. And we are back. Welcome back, fuck nuggets. Wow. <laughs> it's my alter ego, Professor Disregard. Uh, my friends and I were playing Sea of Thieves one night. It was me, Robin, and actually her friends who are my friends. Um, and we were just having a good time. And it was around the time Dr. Disrespect was like coming into prominence. And I thought he was just like the most absurd character I've ever heard of. So I was like, I should just start a channel and call myself Professor Disregard and call the people that follow me fuck nuggets. <laughs> It and, was uh, so stupid. Didn't work out. But anyways. Is that stream still up somewhere? It, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> maybe. I don't, maybe. I Who don't knows? know. It's, it was like four or five years ago. But anyways, before I begin, there's something I want to note. A uh, wonderful spooky friend named Jamdots on Discord recommended that we cover the topic of the trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Uh, and when this came up, Robin and I both had the same reaction. We've already covered that. Uh, but then we looked through the episode list, and by we, I mean I. Uh, and lo and behold, we haven't. There's no episode named after Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. So then I enlisted Robin's help and I said, hey, have we covered this? Because I swear we have. She said, I'm pretty sure that I covered it, meaning her. And I thought, yeah, that does sound right. Um, and then I thought maybe it's in the Haunted Asylum episode, the one that I referenced earlier. So I listened to that episode today. And lo and behold, it is not in that episode either. So... I just want to go ahead and say that when I brought this up in Discord, multiple folks were were saying the same thing. They swear we had covered it at some point. And I think this is a very good example of the Mandela effect hitting all of us. Because from what I can find, we've never covered this topic. Uh, I'm bringing this up, one, because of Mandela effect. And two, because if any spooky friends out there know beyond the shadow of a doubt, if we did cover it, what episode it is, let us know. I'll give you a shout on the next episode with a huge thank you. However, if you at us and say, I'm pretty sure you covered it with no evidence, that's not helpful. So just shush. You just shush on those ones. I'm very curious if anyone was like, I know it's episode 97. You guys brought it up during a topic where you covered something else and you covered it halfway. Th- I'm just curious because if not, I would like to cover it because there's so much material on it. I'm just kind of dreading covering a topic we've already covered you know yeah we've done almost 200 episodes we haven't stumbled through that quite yet so hopefully that does not happen but just wanted to give that a little attention because i thought it was interesting uh that said this week i really thought about doing something haunted robin said she was going to do something haunted actually she originally said she was going to do something true crime so i thought i'll take the haunted angle then as we started doing research I think she took the haunted angle and I was like, that's pretty good because as I was perusing through some of the haunted things that we haven't covered yet, I couldn't help but think of the TV show Chernobyl. Uh, we watched that about a month ago, I think, maybe a little bit longer and we talked about it on the show, how we enjoyed it. Um, because as haunting as a house is or a hotel or an asylum can be, man-made disasters are so fascinating and so shocking. So I said, F it, I'm going to find a man-made disaster. And man, did I find a lot. Basically, human beings are awful. Yeah. Well, basically, a small group of human beings are awful at any given time. And if they're in control of important or dangerous things, a big group of human beings who aren't awful often get affected by that. And this particular incident is no exception. In fact, I was so engrossed with so many of the things I found when looking for man-made disasters and how this one unfolded, I've decided December this year is going to be disaster December for me, and I'm going to be covering those, some natural, some man-made. But for today, I'll be covering the Bhopal chemical disaster. One of the things I want to say before we even get rolling here is that we bring you all of these things through the lens of informative humor. I think that's how I think of it, at least. Sometimes that's weird to do, 
when we're covering true crime or sad paranormal origin stories or possessions that have very vivid, very depressing details because that just rings very true and it's real life. And we don't want to basically take away from that by making silly jokes here and there. Right. And I'll try and do my best when it comes to conveying to you the seriousness of this topic because it is a serious thing. But when you look at some of the pictures that has happened uh, from this particular it's incident. super tragic. It's absolutely tragic. It's very hard to look at. There was a point where I had to stop writing my script because I had a lump in my throat that hurt so fucking bad. I was like, just look away for a little while, watch some Try Guys, go back to your script, and then continue writing. It wasn't medical, right? It's like you've been dealing with something by your throat that gets really hard. So no, it's just... because you get a lump in your throat when you're upset. Okay. So thanks for <laughs> disclosing my medical illness. <laughs> okay. Or just whatever's going on with me. So... Uh, don't think that the importance of this matter is lost on me in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I do try and deliver this with some sense of humor because it is such a serious topic. I find it's just easier to take in the information. And I think this is something very important that people know about. Because the other thing I wanted to say is that until tonight, I have never heard of this. You haven't heard of this either. No, I've never heard of it. I'd be willing to bet that the majority, possibly the vast majority of the folks who listen to this show have not heard of the Bhopal chemical disaster either. As I know, because you've already told me who the culprit was, right? Is it having to do with that by any chance? What culprit? America. I mean, it's not like America did this on its own, but we're involved in this. So I just don't know if it's a cover up for our country where it's like, we're not going to tell our people that we did this. I don't know what eventually broke down why this did not have a bigger impact and okay. we didn't know more about it. Aside from the fact that awful man-made disasters happen so frequently, if you're not around when one happens, you might not ever know about it. Like okay. a good example is, I think the Exxon Valdez happened in 1989. I was four and I remember that's all anyone talked about at the time. And I'd be willing to bet people born in the 90s probably don't even know what that word means. Hmm. And it's just this giant oil spill yeah. that happened. And there's so many that have happened since. They probably remember a different one. This event that took place took place not that long ago. It wasn't the way, way back. It was 1984. It was the mid-80s, which Robin just got done telling you is not a long time ago. Y'all remember 1984, right? Gallon of gas was $1.10. Dang. Average cost of a new house across the United States was $86,700. And a movie ticket only cost $2.50, which was good back in 1984 because Terminator, Ghostbusters, Temple of Doom, oh, and shit. The Karate Kid all came out in 1984. Wow. Solid year for movies. Other things that happened in 1984. Of note, the Summer Olympics were held in Los Angeles. Uh, a typhoon... Uh, called Typhoon Ike, hit the Philippines, killed 3,000 people, and the Prime Minister of India was assassinated. What? Pretty intense year. There's a lot of other stuff that also happened in 1984, but those are the highlights that I pulled, and it's sad because that wasn't all that happened in India. There's this place in India called Bhopal. It's a very large city. In fact, it's the capital city of the Indian state known as, and I'm going to butcher this, Madhya Pradesh. Sorry, but that's how I could figure out how to say it by watching a bunch of videos online. Uh, but essentially, India has states very similar to the United States. Just like the United States, we have capitals in our state. Carson City is the capital of Nevada, I think. Uh, Indianapolis is the capital of Indiana. Those are the states I lived in. I know those ones. And in this case, Bhopal is the capital of this particular state. So picture your state capital, wherever you're at. And this is what I want you to keep in mind while we go through this. Back in 1984, Bhopal was home to a pesticide plant owned by a company called Union Carbide India Limited, UCIL. This particular plant had been built in 1969. Nice. <laughs> At this point, you may be asking, Adam, what is a pesticide? It is a substance that is meant to control pests. It's typically chemical and it's on some type of plant. I think I read a, a statistic that said 80% of all pesticides used uh, are actually to prevent weeds. So like weed killer in a garden or mm, something okay. along that. And then another giant percentage is to protect crops from insects uh, and making sure that they don't get destroyed by them. Uh, but like anything that's a liquid chemical and it's meant to kill something, it is hazardous. 
So there's always like that give or take. There's a whole different topic there about hazardous chemicals being put on food people eat. And it's not like it's just being put there just to be like, we're dicks. We like putting chemicals on food. It came from a sense of let's preserve the crops from the pests that could destroy it. So that said, moving forward, within this plant in Bhopal, lots and lots of these hazardous pesticides were created and stored. It's interesting as well because in the early 1980s, the demand for pesticides had dropped dramatically. Despite that, the powers that be at the Bhopal plant did not scale back production. And when you have more product on hand than you are selling, you have to store it. And they were storing a whole lot of it. Now, I'm going to get a tiny bit scientific on you since I think there are folks out there who are definitely smarter than me that listen to our show. The plant was making a pesticide called Seven, S-E-V-I-N. It's an insecticide. So it is a pesticide for preventing insects from eating plants. Okay. Part of the process to create Seven is to use a chemical known as MIC. MIC stands for methyl isocyanate. Don't know what that means. I could look at pictures of the chemical structure of it. It doesn't mean anything to me. But for anyone out there who's like, I know what that is. Now you know. I'm going to refer to it as MIC moving forward. For your, for you science minded. That's funny. That's a good joke. For you science minded individuals. Now you know what I'm referring to. And I'll give further explanation of what MIC is in a little while. So in 1984, the plant was only 15 years old. It had been built in 69. That's not that old. If it's a person, it can't even drive yet. You'd think things would be in fairly good shape if it's only 15 years old. But there were problems happening up to a decade prior, maybe even longer. In 1974, residents in a nearby village found a well that was contaminated with pesticide. So their pesticide was leaking into the water source. Correct. There was a pool of water that was being fed by a rubber pipe that, when followed, originated from the factory. Local farmers didn't realize that their cattle had wandered to this pool to drink from. When they found their cattle there, they followed the rubber pipe and realized, oh, this is coming from the factory. And then within days of drinking the water, all their cattle had died. That's a lawsuit right there. When this happened, local scientists took samples of the soil and analyzed it. Despite only being in operation for less than five years when this event took place, the ground itself, not just the well, was showing heavy contamination from different types of heavy metals. So the water was contaminated enough to kill cattle. Uh, water from other wells were sampled from the surrounding area and they were all found to contain a toxic chemical or toxic chemical substances in abundance. UCIL had these findings, had these sent to them by the local villagers and they kept them secret. They didn't respond to anyone asking for recompense. They basically decided, uh, silence was how they're going to meet this. So classy shit from the start. When the plant was seven, seven, I was going to say 17, when the plant was seven years old in 1976, two of the local trade unions that had workers within the plant filed official complaints regarding pollution within the plant itself. They sent the complaints to UCIL plant managers, so people that were in charge, the plant inspector who was in charge of making sure this did not happen, and the Ministry of Labor for the state to let them know this is going on here. You should all know about it. None of these received any answer do they have like an osha there is that a thing not really i think the local trade union can appeal to places like the ministry of labor okay but there isn't that other organization or their other government entity to make sure these things are up to code there are independent evaluations of safety that happen and i'll get to those in a little bit okay so in a plant that makes poison that's just generally a dangerous thing you know it's a hazardous job to say the least and they are doing it within a plant that is now itself hazardous. In 1978, the factory had a large fire breakout. Oh my God. So just nine years after this place opened, and we're really not doing well so far because the industrial accidents that I'm listing, one, are not all of them. <laughs> Two, industrial accidents are certainly not the goal, but they will happen. But these are the notable accidents. These aren't like so-and-so got hurt, so-and-so got hurt. These are like the big ones. And we've already gotten several of them within the first nine years. Uh, when they wound up investigating the fire, it turns out that raw materials were being stored where they shouldn't be and wound up catching fire because of that. Wow. This particular incident was super suspicious 
because the local government had just imposed an import restriction on several of those materials and many employees suspected that management actually started the fire rather than deal with those regulations. Oh, um, It was very much thought by the unions and the workers that management started the fire. No one was hurt. Those materials were destroyed and parts of the factory were severely damaged and had to be repaired. So, kind of sus. Another thing is that Despite investigating how the fire started, which had to happen, management never filed an official report on the incident. What? They investigated a fire it. started and they never... <laughs> an industrial fire in a pesticide factory was investigated, and then they just said, cool, no report necessary. Wow. 1981 rolls around, and an accident occurred where a valve malfunctioned, and a worker was splashed with chemicals. He took his mask off while panicking and wound up inhaling gas. Because of this, he was dead 72 hours later. When the official report was filed afterwards, management blamed the worker for taking off his mask and absolutely 100% left out the fact that there was a faulty valve that was the actual source of the accident. This reminds me of the episode of New Amsterdam this past season where the valve in the higher levels of the hospital was leaking and all those chemicals were leaking out into the rest of the water source in the hospital. and It's... Oh, it's going to get a whole lot worse. Oh, so, God. Okay. That said, the union filed a report on this, pointing out how full of shit management was, and also pointed out that the valve hadn't been fixed, and that the worker had never been provided with the PVC overalls, so basically the, the protective clothing that they're supposed to wear. And on top of that, two other workers were seriously fucking injured by this valve in the same incident, and they still basically tried to say, well, the guy who died took off his mask. That's what caused all this. The logic made absolutely no sense. The unions were finally starting to get fed up. The guy who passed away had a neighbor who was a journalist, and he was so upset when he found out what happened, he started investigating what was happening within the factory. When realizing the factory was essentially a giant shit show and a ticking time bomb, he started writing articles about the current state and the possible future state of what would happen if nothing changed. So keep that in mind. This guy starts writing in 1981. In 1982, the leaks start. Now, I could go over all the incidents that happened between 1982 and the 1984 event that I've already promised you, but it would be the longest script I've literally ever done. <laughs> Holy shit! So when I was going through different sources, I finally found the incident report filed by an independent organization that's over 200 pages long, and I just dug through so many pages of that. And when I was going through incidents leading up to the big incident... I was shocked how many there were, like absolutely floored. Three incidents occurred in 1982 alone with massive burns and severe health effects for around 20 workers, plus a joint on a pipe while it was being used wound up rupturing and the entire plant had to be evacuated. Wow. During that particular incident, a plume of MIC, that chemical I had mentioned, erupted from the factory and moved towards a settlement. The people noped right the fuck out because they were so nervous. During that particular incident, an MIC supervisor rushed into where the leak was to stop it. He suffered horrific burns all over his body. It was at this point, the local union, because no action was being taken to repair the conditions that were in this factory, the local union printed out 6,000 posters and handed them out in the local communities, warning of the conditions and the possible effects that it could have within the water, the land, and future catastrophes is the best way to put it. The Hindu union leader went on a hunger strike at the entrance of the factory to try and bring attention to the seriousness of this situation. And the UCIL did finally take action because of how much attention was brought by that hunger strike and that incident. And the action they took was to ban any and all union meetings inside the factory. A tent was erected outside the factory for meetings and a UCIL member showed up <laughs> and burned it to the fucking ground. What the fuck? There was a scuffle over this. People wound up getting hurt as well. UCIL then began laying off all union leaders in the company and releasing statements that the factory was, quote, one of the safest ships in the modern industrial fleet. The leaders that had been laid off had meetings and marches in the local communities to bring awareness to what was happening, and the UCIL released statements stating that they were, quote, agitators who wanted higher salaries and shorter working hours. 
The journalist who had been writing articles for the last three years kept writing them over that period of time. He also sent letters to the chief minister and the chief justice of the Supreme Court requesting the factory be closed down because of the egregious violations. He received no responses. The final article he published on this matter was published in July of 1984. It was titled Bhopal on the Brink of Disaster. The MIC chemical that they had to produce so that they could produce their pesticide was stored in tanks. Three tanks to be precise. These tanks were labeled 610, 611, and 619. Okay? They missed an opportunity there. To label it 069? (laughs) I suppose. So on October 21st, 1984, a day after one of my best friends in the whole wide world was born. Shout out to you, Tim. I love you. Aww. October 20th, 1984 is his does birthday. Does he listen to the show? He does. Oh, that's so cute. I told you that last show too. Oh. Anyways, on October 21st, 1984, the nitrogen pressure in tank 610 dropped to one fifth of its normal level. None of the excess MIC stored in that tank could be extracted because of the extremely low pressure. So, these tanks could hold up to 60 tons of MIC. They were never supposed to be filled over 50% per safety regulations. They were shown in official documents, which are mostly falsified, and we know that at this point, to be at at least 70% capacity at the time, which they should not be at. Wow. It's thought that they were filled much more than that. So... With the nitrogen pressure so low, they didn't have a way to get the MIC out. So they just said, fuck it, just leave it, and they abandoned the tank. The best way I can describe this to you is this liquid is in there, it's this horrific chemical, and you have to keep the tank pressurized so you can pump stuff out of it, okay? Okay. All of a sudden, the nitrogen that you keep in there with it, so it has pressure, just goes away. You don't know why. The PSI just sort of drops. And if you try and open the valve up to like get some MIC out, nothing's coming out. And rather than do literally anything about it, they're like, fuck it, abandon tank 610. That's what they do. They leave tank 610 and they just move forward. So that was October 21st. November 30th rolls around and the nitrogen pressure falls in tank 611. And nitrogen is incredibly flammable, right? Correct. I did not mention... That MIC is also incredibly flammable. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, God. So okay. now two of the three tanks are fucked. And management solution, <laughs> this is so, like, I, I when I read this, I was like, I have worked for some shitty managers, and this rings so true. 611 goes down. You know what they say? What? Try 610 again. What the? <laughs> Go back to the one we know is broken and abandoned and just see if it's magically fixed. And they tell them, nope, it's not. And they tell them, pump nitrogen into it. And see what happens. So they do. They pump more nitrogen into it. And guess what? It doesn't hold pressure. (laughs) If you have a flat tire and you pump air into it, and while you're pumping air into it, you're like, and you can see the tire visibly deflating after receiving new air. You know what that means? It means you have a leak. And they never tried to find it. What? When 611 failed, management just thought it'll magically work. Pump nitrogen into 610. That failed. And they said, well... I guess go check 611 and see if you can find a problem. And the workers do. And as they're checking it, they find a defective valve and they repair it. And management says, perfect, problem solved. 611's working. Nothing is done for 610. They don't have them check the same valve on 610, try and get 610 operational. They just say, problem solved, we don't care. At this point, you may be thinking, doesn't someone do inspections on this shit like Robin mentioned earlier? Yes, dear listener. Yes, they do. In the U.S. and the United Kingdom, inspections on facilities such as this are done once a year. Elsewhere, it's done once every two years. The safety audit on this particular plant was performed in May of 1982 most recently, which I think is really, really interesting because it's already been over two years before this incident takes place. Okay. And another inspection hasn't been done. But... The inspection done two and a half years prior listed, quote, from this inspection report, quote, a total of 61 hazards on site, 30 of them major and 11 minor, end quote. So that adds up to 41, not 61. So those 11 minors that are listed were minor hazards within very dangerous areas. So they might be minor, but they need to be fucking fixed. The other 20 were minors and less dangerous areas. On top of that, 
the audit showed that the staff weren't properly trained or equipped. They attributed this to the high turnover because they kept fucking firing anyone who knew what they were doing and who spoke up when they noticed something was seriously wrong. There was also a lack of proper maintenance reports, a lack of safety equipment, and poor storage for the existing safety equipment. There was a lack of checks on all alarm systems to even see if they were functioning correctly. 1984 hits, one of the engineers who built the plant came in and was so scared at the state of the plant, he conveyed his fears directly to the leaders of the UCIL. Wow. They completely ignored him. So they acted like he didn't exist. They're warned over and over and over again. They're Something's like wrong. It's getting worse. So snap back to the end of 1984. It was November 30th. 611 malfunctioned, was temporarily repaired. 610 was abandoned again. Fade to black. White letters appear on the screen, and they say December 2nd, 1984. Two days after the incident with 611. The evening rolls around on December 2nd and something happens. Now allow me to give you the state of the factory at this moment, the evening of December 2nd, 1984. These conditions I'm about to provide to you are the ones that were admitted to by the UCIL and their reputation is absolute garbage because all they do is lie and it's only gonna get worse from this point. But according to the UCIL, the factory was in the following condition. Tank temperatures were not logged. The vent gas scrubber was not in use. The cooling system was not in use. A slip bind was not used when the pipes were washed. That one's particularly important because it was noted in the safety report that the people who were performing tasks weren't doing them correctly and when they were asked why, they were told two things. One, we were never trained how to do this and two, when we asked, shouldn't we do something oh specifically God. to make this safer? They were told no. So they put this into their own report that this slip bind was not used when the pipes were washed. The concentration of chloroform in tank 610 was too high. Tank 610 was not pressurized. Iron was present in tank 610 because of corrosion, wow. because it was not properly maintained. 610's high temperature alarm was not functioning. So if it were to start heating up, they would not know. And tank 619, which was the evacuation tank in case something went wrong with tank 610, was fucking full. Oh my God. That is what's happening on the evening of December 2nd, according to the biggest fucking liars I've ever read about. <laughs> now that you know the state of the factory, here's what happens. And I'm going to break this down with a timeline that was put together by some wonderful investigators because it gets pretty crazy okay 10 20 p.m local time the pressure of 610 is noted and logged as 2 psi what for reference a human's breath pressure so if you want to blow as hard as you can it can be measured between 1 and 2 psi if you tried to ride a bike or drive a car on a tire with 2 psi your tire would be absolutely shredded it would be essentially completely flat that is the pressure in tank 610. 10.45 p.m. There's a shift change. The new workers show up. The new shift comes in, and they start noting immediately that they have throat and eye irritation. They notice that they think there is an MIC, the toxic chemical we've been talking about, leak near where the lines are being washed. I had mentioned that that night they were washing the lines, yeah. and they were doing it improperly because that's how they were trained. This new shift comes on and says, I think there's an MIC leak near where they're washing out these pipes. So they think there's something wrong. However, leaks like this were fairly normal in this factory because it's such a gigantic shit show. So they get there, something seriously wrong. They're being exposed to deadly chemicals and they think, normal night. Same shit, different day. What the French toast, dude? 11 p.m. hits. The MIC leak is reported for the first time by a field operator. Tank 610 is now recorded as having 10 PSI. The operator states that despite the fact that it was listed as 10 PSI by a manager, it was actually at 2 PSI. It was still at 2 PSI, and that same operator noted that when they checked the logs, they noticed that it had been recorded for three straight hours at 2 PSI, which they all know is incredibly dangerously low. 11.37 p.m. MIC is leaking into the area where the tanks are stored. 
So these three massive tanks storing this incredibly dangerous liquid, this incredibly dangerous chemical, they just have leaks happening around it. Six minutes later at 11.43 p.m., operators notice dirty water spilling from the higher levels in the structures that contain and process the MIC chemical. So that water is the chemical. It is contaminated water that has the chemical in it. They also notice, and this is very important, the MIC itself is in the air. So, pretty quick break now. Let me tell you more about MIC as we're building up this tension. As you probably guessed, it is considered extremely toxic and extremely hazardous to human health. There is, to this date, no known antidote for exposure. Whoa! It is toxic by inhalation, ingestion, and just by making general contact with it. So how does it hurt you? It makes you bleed uncontrollably. It makes your tissues, especially your lungs, heart, and brain, store more blood than they should and can often lead to you drowning in your own blood. It is so toxic. The limit for its presence across the board by safety regulations in the world is 0.02 parts per million. This is one of the most toxic things to human beings that we know of. And it is in the air and the water in this factory in copious amounts. Now let's snap back to that night in December 1984. It's now midnight on the dot. We have arrived at December 3rd. 12.09 p.m., brownish water and steam are coming out of drains that are eight yards off the ground. They're no longer in the bowels of the factory. The ground level drains have steam coming out of them and that steam is and that this chemical, brown liquid right correct a supervisor recommends turning off the water taps because they have been hosing stuff down but only after their tea break uh. at the same time <laughs> operators find a what? section of pipe in the factory that is leaking mic they attach a hose to this pipe and attempt to return it to a spot in the control room where it can rejoin the MIC flow properly. At this moment, they believe that this leak that hasn't officially been called out yet may be contained. They report the leak to the control room and are told to spray water around the point of leakage that they had just discovered. More water. 12.15 p.m., the tea break begins. The person who serves the tea is known as the tea boy. Oh my, shut This is true. The T-boy enters the room and notices, quote, the atmosphere is tense, end quote. Operators state during the tea break, the alarm signaling a major release went off for, quote, only several minutes. Only several minutes. There was also a rule within this factory that only one supervisor was allowed to take a tea break at a time. Both supervisors that were present that night and the only superintendent at the plant We're all taking a tea break at the exact same time. And as a side note, tea breaks last for 45 minutes. Oh my, what? They were on a tea break when they, quote, received report of the incident, end quote. Oh my, oh, 45 minutes for a tea break. Operators went back to tank 610. This is all at 1215. They went back to tank 610. Water and MIC was still leaking. The tank pressure was now reading 30 PSI. It was two. It was going to explode. It is now at 30, and it is rising rapidly. Within moments, in fact, the investigation notes that this takes place on the exact same minute at 12.15 as reading 30 PSI. They noticed something was wrong, looked around, looked back, and the gauge was now reading 55 PSI. The gauge only went up to 55 PSI. Oh, Because that was the end of the danger zone for that because it had become incredibly dangerous. They checked valves that Wasn't were leading that in Chernobyl too, where, where they just like, take fake readings. Bec- yep. Well, no, but their their meters only went up to a certain extent. But they in Chernobyl, they were just like, "We'll just take that reading and not try and measure the actual reading." Yeah. These guys, in this case, say, "Let's check the valves leading from the tank because the valves have different measurements. Those valves leading from the tank showed that they were at 100 degrees Celsius." Oh my god. 212 degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise known as water's boiling point when water will turn to steam. And the PSI was showing at 100 PSI. Almost twice that of the top of the danger zone. They're now in the disaster zone. Control And a control room operator at this exact time knows something is wrong. 
And he goes to the storage area. When he enters there, he hears a hissing from the safety relief valve. That means that the valve has popped off, literally. It means the safety release valve is now expelling the gas that is being created to avoid an explosion. Because if it doesn't do it, there is going to be a massive explosion of epic proportions. That is what's happening in the safety relief valve storage area. 12.19 p.m., four minutes later, the two operators that are at tank 610 feel movements inside the tank. This next part I'll read as a quote from the incident report directly. Quote, a geyser burst from the spot where the gas leak was detected. The operator set off the general alarm. The supervisor left his tea. <laughs> That's how you know it's fucking serious. The supervisor left his tea and rushed to the tank. The tank and the concrete were trembling, cracking, and creaking. That's terrifying. This tank is so filled with pressure, it is starting to literally rupture from where it's been bolted to the ground and move around. This thing holds 60 fucking tons of this absolutely toxic chemical, and it is just rocking and a-rolling. At this moment, the alarm glass in the factory, where if you shatter it, full alarm, the entire factory is broken, and the full factory loud siren begins. It lasts for three minutes, and then the alarm is muted in case things need to be communicated and you can't be heard over the alarm. At this point, they assume after 180 seconds, everyone knows shit is fucked. 12.30 a.m. I might have been saying p.m. this whole time for all the 12s. It's the morning. You guys get that. 12.30 a.m. Tank 610 is getting even hotter. And there is a general rumbling sound in the factory. <laughs> the entire factory can hear this rumbling. I will read another quote here. Quote. Tank 610 then stood vertically. So this tank just flips vertically. Imagine a pill oh, okay. shaking violently and gotcha. then flips on the long end. Okay. And returning to the quote, fell, so it falls to the ground and stood up again, but did not burst. A second geyser erupted from a ruptured pipe at ground level. So now we're talking about a ruptured pipe exploding with a geyser erupting from it with this toxic steam of this chemical mixed with whatever is happening within that tank. 1241, 11 minutes later, all workers are evacuated from the factory. And at 1250, the emergency squad tries to control the leak by massive water spraying. And that does not work. And I'll tell you why. When the workers had been cleaning the pipe earlier in the day, they had been told not to seal off the pipes with that slip bind that was noted by the UCIL. That is how they were trained. The combination of the whole didn't follow procedures because they weren't told it was needed and they weren't properly trained to do anything uh, is very deadly in this case. That water was able to reach tank 610. So they have all this toxic runoff that's mainly just water, but it's still pretty shitty water that reaches tank 610. Tank 610 has two PSI within it, so there's no pressure to keep the tank, which had a known leak, from allowing water into it. So it's not like this is a sealed tank. This is a tank with an opening that was never investigated, never found, and never sealed. So imagine having some glass that's 80% full, but it's cracked and something else can pour into it. And there's no pressure within it to keep it out. Imagine someone dumping a bucket of water in your face and you trying to keep any of the water from getting in your mouth by blowing. And that's essentially what's happening right now. <laughs> and it happens continuously throughout the night with all this water flooding into tank 610. Okay. 610's higher temperature alarm wasn't functioning that night. It probably just wasn't functioning in general. So when the water began to reach boiling point temperature, when the tank eventually started to heat up, shit hit the fan because now there's no longer water in that. It is gas. It is highly pressurized and it needs somewhere to go. And whatever leak existed to allow the water in is not enough to allow the pressure of this superheated water out. So how badly is this? Well, aside from the fact that every safety release valve released the steam, which is now poisonous steam that had this toxic chemical mixed in with it. Uh, there was also pipes that just outright exploded. So a huge cloud of this toxic gas shot into the atmosphere. Within two hours, 40 tons of MIC was propelled into the atmosphere of Bhopal in this massive toxic cloud. And then it immediately began to drift towards the populated areas oh, nearby. Jesus. Of oh, what essentially Jesus. amounts to counties, I think they said 37 counties were affected 
by this cloud. The gas drifted over populated areas with men, women, and children. Most of them were aware of the dangers of this particular factory, and all of the concerns that they had had previously about this factory had been completely ignored to this point. This just whole thing reminds me of Chernobyl. In so many ways. Like that's those, uh, I, I mean, in the show, they, they show how the scientists that were so far away did a swab of their windows, the, their window panes, and tested the dust on their window panes. And the and, radiation levels were so high. Yes. They thought for sure it had to be a nearer meltdown. And it couldn't be Chernobyl because yeah. Chernobyl was too far away unless it literally blew up, which it did. This I will get whole back. thing reminds me of that. I will get back to this. So this toxic chemical cloud is now floating onto this multitude of people. These folks had sudden attacks in the middle of the night and in the morning, depending on how fast the cloud reached them, that started with severe eye irritation. I will now put a trigger warning for the next 90 seconds if you don't want to hear about how all these people died. Started with severe eye irritation and then coughing. Then they couldn't breathe. During the suffocation, their stomachs felt like it was being shredded apart because Ugh. it was. They vomited the contents of their stomach out, which at this point was pretty much overwhelmingly filled with blood. Because that's what the chemical does, right? It makes you bleed. Correct. Most people died of asphyxiation, some suffering from the unbreathable air, some drowning in their own blood, which had filled their lungs. Others had hearts fail from the accumulation of blood literally weighing down their hearts so much where it could no longer beat. Some of them died from brain bleeds that were immediate and absolute, and there was no preventing any of it. Those that escaped suffered debilitating effects, most of which would lead to their death in the following weeks. Pregnant women, which amounted to around 3,500 folks that were affected by these clouds, had stillbirth rates that were 300% higher than the standard. Those children that were born alive had a neonatal mortality rate of 200% above normal. The immediate death toll was reported at 1,408 people. It was then changed almost immediately to 1,754 people and then changed again to 2,259 people. UCIL tried to do the thing that companies do when they murder a bunch of people through negligence. They lied about it. By 1991, seven years later, it was tallied to be, quote unquote, officially 3,928 people that died. This number does not include anyone who died within the following weeks. Only upon the initial eruption, the number would likely include at least 8,000 more people if that were the case. More would die from their injuries after the two-week period, and a more accurate death toll will be around 14 to 16,000 people. There is a problem with that number as well. Individuals who are not permanent residents of these places were not counted. If you were visiting for any reason in any way, shape, and form, and you did not maintain a legal residence in this area, and you died, you did not matter. You were not wow. counted. Your family was not compensated. That's what? Wow. Oh, my God. Of those that did not die and were lucky enough to live with their horrific, debilitating injuries that significantly shortened their lives, the UCIL did not keep a count. It was not official. That said, there is an official number because so many folks filed lawsuits and had to prove that they actually were affected by this poisonous gas cloud. And the most recent number of official cases confirmed to be affected and paid recompense to is 730,000 people. Wow. Actually, it's 730,000 cases, so it could be higher than that. The UCIL was owned, and this is where the America part comes in. The UCIL was owned by a company called Union Carbide Corporation. The UCC still exists to this day. It is an American company. It took them five years after this accident to pay those who were affected. The Indian government put a price tag of $3.3 billion on it, which is astronomically high, especially for 1984. The UCC offered $350 million as compensation. When they finally agreed to a settlement, the UCC paid $470 million, significantly less than the $3.3 billion that the Indian government tried to get. The Indian government filed legislation within their own ranks so they could represent every single person affected by this disaster to make sure they were taken care of. Wow. 730,000 people was the number of affected that were confirmed to have been paid that had survived the disaster. That means if you had lung, heart, or brain bleeds that didn't kill you but left you suffering and alive, UCC was nice enough to toss you $644. That's nuts. 
That is the reality of what happened to these people on December 3rd, 1984, and then the following years. It took them 15 years to clean the site. They literally extracted Tank 610, hosed it down, and it still resides on the side of a fucking road in oh, town. What? I will post a picture on our Instagram. It is nuts. Some of these photos were so despicable, I can't put them on our Instagram because it'll be taken down. Yeah. It's, of just it's nuts. dead bodies and people wailing and people going through their death throes. It was so hard to look at these things. It is not shocking that people were disgusted and outraged in India. They demanded the UCC and its CEO at the time named Warren Anderson be brought to trial for criminal negligence. Every suit brought against Warren Anderson was ignored. What? The people of Bhopal, India, have been appealing to the U.S. government to force the UCC and Warren Anderson, despite the fact he is no longer the CEO, to stand trial in India because every time they would file lawsuits within the United States of America, they would eventually reach the Supreme Court and be transferred to India as this did not happen on American soil. Wow. They have been protesting for justice for so long. There are pictures online of them holding signs asking Barack Obama, the president of the United States, in 2012 to send someone over there to be held responsible for what happened to them. That is a long time to be seeking justice. In 2010, seven Indian nationals, seven citizens of the country of India that were members of the UCIL in 1984, which is essentially the Indian version of this corporation, okay. were brought to trial and all found guilty of causing death by negligence. All seven were given the maximum punishment allowed by Indian law, which is two years in jail. What the? And a fine of $2,500. That's it? That is it. Also, immediately following the verdict, they are allowed to post bail and then leave because apparently that's how things work over there when it comes to their bail what system. What the... F- what the... To make this whole thing so much worse, UCIL and UCC published their own report on what they believe caused this accident. They blamed the workers. Not just the workers, but they stated that they believe a single disgruntled rogue worker must have hooked up a hose to a pressure valve and then hooked it up to tank 610 because there was no way this could happen otherwise. They then used this report to try and deny any form of liability and any compensation to anyone affected for what had happened and put it back on the workers that had been trying desperately to get this problem fixed before it became a catastrophe. All these people that had been warning that this was going to happen were officially blamed by the company For what had happened. And the final cherry on top of this, so you know just how awful these fucking people are. The UCC had, and I believe still has, a plant in Virginia in the United States of America. A safety audit performed in September of 1984, two and a half months prior to the disaster, stated that the factory in Virginia had, quote, a number of defects and malfunctions. It also warned that, quote, a runaway reaction could occur in the MIC unit storage tanks and that the planned response would be would not be timely or effective enough to prevent catastrophic failure of the tanks, end quote. The UCC had this report. The company was completely and entirely aware that this could cause exactly what happened to happen. And despite knowing this, And knowing of the safety failures already happening in Bhopal, the company never sent the report to the Bhopal plant. Wow. They refused to do it. Why? It's also quite interesting because the plant's main designs were identical. There is no reason to think that this would not affect them. They knew all of this and they still tried to blame and to this day officially blame a single rogue worker for what happened, pretending like this evidence doesn't fucking exist. This is a story of a small number of absolutely disgustingly evil human beings that were as corrupt as possible, and they refused to do anything about a disaster they had created over the course of a decade and a half. And when the exact people who had tried to warn them were killed in the most horrific way most of us can imagine, because of this negligence, they still had the audacity to blame them for it. 
The Bhopal chemical disaster is considered, even with the incorrect statistics, to be one of the worst industrial disasters in human history. Based off the amount of people affected, not just killed, but affected by the toxic cloud and displaced, it is considered by many to be worse than the Chernobyl meltdown. Wow. And to be the worst industrial disaster in human history. The debates that I have found online regard not the number of humans affected, but the amount of land that was toxified, essentially. Oh. Because the exclusion zone won't be habitable for a significantly longer amount of time yeah. than this particular incident. And the most upsetting thing to me about this entire thing, I had no idea this happened. Yeah, I had, until I'd never heard six of that. Until six fucking hours ago. Yeah, I had no idea about that at all. The UCC still operates. It still owns places. The UCC was bought by a company who, after... The land was abandoned in like 2001, went back and bought up all the fucking land in India so they could try and develop it later. They poisoned the land and then they're like, ooh, here's an opportunity now that no one wants to do it. And they went back in and they bought it. They can't like do stuff on there, right? Because the ground is literally poisoned. But when it's not, they own the land. How long is it going to take? I don't know. I couldn't find any... Any information regarding how long it takes for this sort of detoxification to happen. Yeah. I just found it took them 15 years to clean up the site of the accident. And they basically just dragged stuff out, identified what they thought was the problem, then tossed it on the side of the road. So it is one of the most despicable things I have ever read of a corporation of horrible management and of a community that knew something was wrong and were absolutely ignored happening that I know about, <laughs> you know? It reminded me so much of watching Chernobyl when I was doing this topic. It absolutely blew my mind. It happened a year before I was born. I've never heard about yeah, it. Yeah, I've never heard of it. No it's, one it's talks nuts. about it. And the other thing that's crazy is when I found the list that had this, It was, of course it was listed as number one as the worst disaster on the list, the worst man-made disaster. There are so many more. <laughs> and I sincerely think the reason I've never heard of it is because of things like Exxon Valdez Deepwater Horizon, all the oil spills that have happened, all the horrific catastrophes that happened based off of greedy fucking corporations refusing to just pay a little bit of extra money to fix some broken piece of equipment, something that's failure would lead to a catastrophic disaster because they just decide like, it's not worth my fucking time to care because I won't personally be affected by it unless I might get fired. It doesn't matter whose livelihoods I destroy, whose lives are taken in the process, it's an inconvenience for me to even think about this, so I refuse to do it. And going through this, I realized how awful human beings are sometimes. I feel so bad for the people that were affected by this that are literally to this day begging for justice that they will almost certainly never see. And the fact that they were cut a fucking check for $644 is like getting spit in their face. They can't go back to their homes. Their family members are gone. The medical bills that they have will be unpayable because they'll be consistent for the rest of their lives, which will be significantly shortened. And they gave them about as much money as like a PlayStation 5 and an extra game cost. Oh my God. That's fucked up. Wow. So I found this one to be absolutely fascinating and despicable, and I hope you appreciated it. That is the Bhopal chemical disaster of 1984. Well, I'm glad I know about it now. I hope folks out there enjoyed the episode because i know this was not as like humor laden as most of my topics are but when i was going through the timeline i was like i can't believe this shit is happening there are no jokes to put in here it is a joke within itself that nothing was done with all these people begging them the fucking guys set up a tent outside so they can meet to make sure nothing would go wrong and these fucking people showed up and burned it to the ground so they wouldn't be able to meet it's just like this idea of humanity that if you ignore a problem, that means it doesn't exist until it literally blows up in your face. So, hope you all enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, it was very uh, it, educational. Cool. So, yeah, I appreciated it. All right, so that is everything we have for episode 191. If you have a story that you would like to send us regarding anything paranormal, supernatural, creepy, coincidental, extraterrestrial, or true crime in nature, or anything that you just think would relate to the show's content, please email storytime at scarish.com. Or go to our website, scarish.com, and click on Contact Us. You can also go to our social medias. Facebook is facebook.com slash scarishpodcast. Twitter is at scarishpod, and Instagram is at scarishpodcast. Reach out to us however you feel best. And uh, if you would like to donate to us, Robin, how can they do so? 
You can go to patreon.com slash scariest podcast. Those are monthly donations. Tiers start at a dollar at a dollar. You get ad free, which is awesome. There's also other tiers that you can look at that include merch or, or special little books I send out or something like that. And uh, if you're not into the monthly subscription type thing, you can also go to coffee, K-O dash fi dot com slash scariest podcast. Those are our one time donations. All your donations go to helping us keep the show going, pay for all the background stuff. So website hosting, podcast hosting, all that fun stuff. And we really couldn't do it without without all you guys. So yeah. indeed. So thank you to everyone who listens. Thank you to everyone who supports us. We sincerely appreciate all of you. And that's just about everything. So Robin, go ahead and sign us out. Keep on creeping on and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye bye.